Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Marissa Lather and I'm a Marketing Manager here at Proficient. And I'm very excited to be moderating today's webinar. Today's session is going to cover perspectives of a Salesforce Financial Services Cloud implementation where we're going to discuss the unique implementation of the Salesforce Financial Services Cloud that Proficient did with Buckingham Strategic Wealth and the role that Orion Connect from Orion Strategic Advisors played and how change management played a crucial role in delivering a path for their long-term vision. Uh, we are recording today and we'll be sure to make sure to email email you with the information on how to access this after the session. Time permitting, we will answer questions at the end of the presentation, so please type those into the chat box. In a moment, I'll hand it over to our speakers, but first let me give you a quick overview of Proficient. Proficient is the leading digital transformation consulting firm serving global 2,000 and enterprise customers throughout North America. With unparalleled information technology, management consulting, and creative capabilities, Proficient and its Proficient Digital Agency deliver vision, execution, and value with outstanding digital experience, business optimization, and industry solutions. We have a broad network of locations all across the U.S. as well as offshore facilities in India and China. We deliver digital experience, business optimization, and industry solutions that cultivate and captivate customers, drive efficiency and productivity, integrate business processes, improve productivity, reduce cost, and create a more agile enterprise. Uh, fast facts, we were founded in 1997. We're a public company with more than 3,000 employees. We form strategic partnerships with each of the major technology vendors and also have dedicated solution and industry practices. So now I'd like to ask, how familiar is your organization with the flexibility and integration that Financial Services Cloud from Salesforce offers? This particular solution helps improve the customer experience, strengthen client relationships, and drive new business by integrating sales, service, and marketing. Digital transformation impacts every area of an organization, and companies that delay it or ignore it risk become, becoming irrelevant. The Financial Services Cloud transforms how wealth and asset management, banking, and insurance companies work with customers, as well as within their own organizations. Finally, a little background on our speakers. John Spires is the Director of Operations at Buckingham Strategic Wealth. John oversees the day-to-day -day management of the technology and data, marketing and events, and onboarding and integrations teams. He helps identify and design solutions that allow Buckingham's technology and other operational areas to be better utilized in order to improve processes and increase efficiency. Next up, we have Joe Liebolt, Technology and Integrations Director at Orion Advisor Services. Joe's team oversees all relationships, development roadmaps, and support for more than 76 integrations with Orion. Joe has been with Orion for 20 years and aspires to help advisors enjoy their business. Although Orion's technology, or through Orion's technology and integration capabilities. Finally, David Chapman is the Director of Organizational Change Management here at Proficient. David has over 20 years of change management and process improvement experience for a vast array of clients. David's team helps clients modify behavior leading to high levels of adoption around business and systems transformation. So, uh, before we start our webinar, I'd like to give everybody a chance to participate in our poll. Let's take the next couple seconds. How many technologies do you use to manage your business? Oh, we're seeing a lot of four and more come in. I think that all of those people are going to be very happy with the integration piece that we're going to get to a little bit later. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and turn it on over to John, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about the Buckingham uh, challenges and the strategies that we use to uh, begin this implementation. John? Hi, everyone. Thanks, Marissa. Uh, and good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. I'm going to quickly uh, give you a little bit of background about Buckingham Strategic Wealth, and then we'll dive into some of the details of the project. So Buckingham Strategic Wealth is a registered investment advisory firm headquartered here in St. Louis, Missouri. 
we operate in a fiduciary model with our clients, supporting them through the creation of customized, comprehensive financial plans. Um, our investment approach is focused around evidence-based, passively managed mutual funds and our fixed income capabilities that we have to offer. So a quick look at some of our early milestones as an organization. Uh, as you can see, we were founded in 1994, one location, local clients, less than 30 associates. Um, skip ahead a year, more than 80 clients. Three years in, we had $100 million in assets under management. It took us 15 years to add our second office, and 17 years, 100 associates. So as you look at that, um, you know, that's early stage growth for us. But if we fast forward a little bit now um, to the last few years, you can see as of June 2014, we had $6.2 billion of assets under management, 200 associates, and seven locations. Skip from June 2014 to today, uh, we have $13.6 billion assets under management, 300 associates, and 23 locations. So, um, definitely a, a slow trend as we got going in those early years, but in the last three, uh, more than doubling our assets under management and tripling the number of locations that we have as an organization. So with that, obviously, um, come some challenges for us and, and opportunities for our growth. So, you know, overall, we had that rapid growth. We needed to be able to address that and deal with it and be ready to grow into the future. Um, along with those um, new offices, you know, many new associates, we began to form new organizational models. So um, doing more regionalization of our teams, um, rolling people up, looking at things a little bit differently as we went. And we also, in the last two years, um, entered into a transformational mindset from a technology perspective. Uh, we'll hear a little bit about this when Joe comes on and talks about Orion, um, but in these last two years, we've replaced our back office system, our portfolio accounting system by moving over to Orion, and then we also went live with Salesforce. Uh, our goal has been to kind of move out of some of our pre-existing technologies that had been around for a while um, and, and really begin to lay a foundation for how do we build going forward. Uh, the growth that we've had over the last three years, we expect to continue. Um, it's even picked up more so here as we've moved into 2018 and so needed uh, a platform that we could use as we went forward. Specifically looking at our Salesforce implementation though, um, if you look at what we had in our existing CRM before we moved, uh, some of the challenges we faced there was access to information. So our advisory teams who used that system uh, could put data in, but struggled with getting data out. They struggled with seeing metrics uh, coming out of that system. The user experience was um, lagging behind in any other system that was out there. And so, you know, with that, you obviously then struggle with adoption, proper usage, those kind of things. I mentioned the, the lack of metrics that we had. Uh, we weren't able to do any integrations to the core systems that we were moving to. Um, in that transformation or anything that we saw kind of on the roadmap coming from us in the future. And we, we had passed the point of evolution of that platform. Um, it was really in more of a support mode and keeping it running, keeping the lights on so that we could, we could get going and, and run our business, but we couldn't really look for opportunities to advance and move to the next step. So with that, uh, one of the, the big initiatives we had along with that Orion project was choosing to replace our CRM system. Um, through some extensive kind of research and due diligence, we decided to, to go down the Salesforce path. And as we did that, though, um, it was important for us to think about these five questions that you see here as what we were considering with our move to Salesforce uh, and for the future of our organization. Uh, a big thing was what were we trying to achieve? And so with that, you know, we were trying to get more than just a CRM. We were selecting, as I mentioned before, this platform, this foundation as we go forward. 
something that would be there for us that we could grow with, um, something that we may not even be ready immediately to use all of the benefits of, but knew we had a long-term vision of how to get there. Um, and with that comes the commitment to the platform, uh, that, that second question. That's a big, a big piece to consider as you get ready to, to move to something like Salesforce. Are you committed, is your organization committed to continue the development, continue to look for um, and assess those new platforms, those other integrations that exist out there that you could bring to bear? Are you willing to invest in the um, potential retraining of existing employees to get them to a space where they can help manage and administer uh, the platform as you go forward? Also, how are you going to approach the implementation itself? Um, are you going to mirror what you have and do a platform kind of lift and shift? Are you going to look for opportunities to improve uh, and take kind of a, a crawl and walk approach as you get into it? Or are you going to try to tackle everything and basically change your business all in one fell swoop as you win? Uh, for us on our side, uh, we took more of that middle ground approach. We said we need to look for opportunities to improve. We've got to get off of our old platform, but we aren't at a spot right now where we want to remake our whole business as we go forward. We want this, again, to be that foundational aspect for us as we go. Next one is how, how are you going to train your users? How are you going to make sure that they're ready uh, for this change and to adopt the system that, you, that you're putting in? Um, David's going to speak to this for us a little bit later, but that was a, a key component for us as we thought about moving to Salesforce, especially when you look at um, that growth we've had, the fact that we've now got those 23 office locations, and how do we get out and how do we work with those individual teams to help get them up to speed. And then how are you going to measure and drive adoption at the end of the day? You know, there's several different pieces that come along with that, but it's always an important thing. You know, for, for those of you who have gone through major technology projects like this would be, um, it's always the question and concern of if we do all of this work, are users going to adopt it at the end of the day? Um, we tackled that in a couple different ways, and we'll talk about um, some of them a little bit later, but you know, we made Salesforce a core part of how our advisory teams work, how our client service teams work. Um, so you know, we could force some of that adoption as you go. But you also have to make sure that your users are happy as you're going through that, that they're able to efficiently do that work that you're kind of forcing them into. So we talked a little bit about what to consider um, as, you, as you think about a Salesforce implementation. Uh, next is kind of taking a look at how we approached our implementation. So first thing we did was start to think about the teams that were going, going to be part of this. Uh, we started by forming a core steering committee, if you will, um, and that was a group of about four of us that was primarily focused on what were we going to accomplish, what were our major goals, how would the implementation work, those kind of pieces. Then we formed a broader core team uh, that included representatives from our advisory teams, from our client service teams, uh, from other groups who would be interacting with the system. This was our group that we went to to collect requirements, to understand pain points that they had with the existing system, to help us define what the next, you know, what the evolution to Salesforce would begin to look like. We built an implementation team uh, on our side, including several who had worked on our past CRM platform, and then also um, some of those who were going to be moving over into new roles as we went live with Salesforce. And then that implementation team was also made up of uh, our representatives from Proficient who were helping guide us through that implementation process itself. And lastly, we went through and defined a product owner. So who was going to have responsibility for the platform as we went um, from both an admin perspective and also helping us look at what's coming next um, with the platform, with other applications, what do we consider as we roll this out. Our timeline for how we approach this um, may be different than, than what some of you see uh, as, as you approach a project like this. A lot of folks, so when, they're, when they're moving up forward on one of these, as soon as you're able to you know, get approval by your licensing, you're ready to go. Um, for us, we actually purchased our licenses in December of 2017, 
And we kind of put the brakes on this project until June of 2018. Um, a lot of that was due to the other projects we had going on. So that move that we were doing to Orion, we wanted our advisory teams, we wanted our client service teams, we needed others to be able to focus on that change that was coming to how they run their day-to-day -day, um, work and, and operations inside their groups. So we were able to press pause on implementation, which actually gave us a lot of time to go through and make sure we were getting what we want out of our, out of our RFP cycle, um, make sure we were answering all of the questions that we had, know how we were going to implement, how we were going to roll it out, and what that would be. So we started in June of 2018 and went live in December of 2018. Um, and that was a full rollout across our entire Buckingham organization. Our project uh, really had three big parts, as you see them there. Change management from the beginning of helping us define some of the pains that our users were facing. Uh, through requirements and discovery then with that broader group, and then into really a build, test, and train uh, for our users because, because of this timeline, because of how we had to go out to, to our other offices, those three components uh, were very compressed from you know, a timeline perspective and just overlapping work as we went. A couple of things you know, to call out as well as we went through this. We knew we wanted to be an active partner in this implementation. Um, luckily, Proficient was willing to let us kind of do that, um, but we were very involved as, as we went through ultimately helping and taking over pieces of that later in the project and then really picking up and owning once we went live uh, to carry it forward to our teams. I mentioned earlier, we knew that we wanted it to be more than a lift and shift. Um, but we weren't going to bite off more than we thought we could chew. We wanted to make sure we got the platform out there. Uh, we knew our advisory teams had gone through a lot of change already uh, in 2017. And I'm going to go back and apologize for those dates of June 2018 and December 2018 there. That was 2017 when those, those things happened. Um, but we knew they had been through a lot of change earlier that year. And so we needed to make this an easy migration for them. We also knew that it was a long view. You know, I mentioned this was foundational for us. We were committed to you know, taking it slow, getting what we needed to run our business, and then quickly beginning to add on additional features, features as we went. And, and again, that change fatigue was going to be real. Um, as we rolled out timelines for this project to our advisory teams, they knew um, that we were going to impact their work, uh, especially in our world when you look at year-end. Uh, that's one of the busiest times for, for our advisors and their teams as they work with their clients. And so we knew we were hitting a, a crazy time of the year for them and that they had already been through a lot. Uh, but it was, it was something important for us to get done last year. One of those big drivers, again, back to you know, why we went this way and, and what was going on and ultimately why we moved um, to some of the integrations we could do with Orion is that integration and flexibility piece. Uh, you know, for those of you in the, in the financial services industry, you know that our space is evolving rapidly from, from what exists out there um, in the past. And so our ability as, a, as an organization to utilize our technology and development teams to, to build as we went forward wasn't going to be there anymore. There was no way that you know, we could keep up with what other companies purely focused on technology could do. You know, our focus on this side is our clients. Um, you know, I've, I've seen organizations before who may say, you know, we are really a technology company the business that we are actually in, that industry we're in, is just kind of a secondary piece for us. But we see ourselves as a technology kind of evolution organization. For us, we're not in that spot. We are here to serve our clients and make their lives better. We need to find those technologies that can help us do that as, as we go along. So we also began a move from, hey, we're going to build everything in-house to beginning to look at and choosing a best of breed that's out there. We, needed, we knew we needed to be able to integrate these various platforms together, and we would still look at the opportunities we had 
to build and fill any gaps that are there. Um, you know, just looking at that landscape, that, that slide on the, that you see uh, with kind of all of the logos there, obviously doesn't represent everything. But that's just some of what the industry uh, platforms look like that are out there now and, and speaks to that massive evolution that, that we see um, in the space. And so one of those big pieces uh, that we knew we needed to have that integration with, again, was, was Orion for us. Uh, it was our core portfolio accounting system. We were going to force and push all of our advisory teams to begin using that platform. We needed to begin to leverage that data into our CRM to make their lives easier. Um, ultimately, with the goal to give them kind of a one pane of glass type of view into uh, the two, two systems that they work with. And that's where working with Joe and his team over at Orion really came into play for us. So as we move to the next one, another poll for everybody there. Uh, are you familiar with the integration possibilities that exist with Salesforce? All right, and it's looking pretty split down the middle right now. So I think we did have a lot of very technically focused people sign up for this webinar. So this is interesting seeing these. Joe, would you like to take it over? Yes, I would. Thank you so much. Uh, John, thank you for, for the things that you, you mentioned about Orion. Um, I will say my name is Joe Liebold. I oversee our tech and integrations here at Orion. Um, we have the privilege of serving Buckingham Asset Management and their investors, and uh, it, it's been a, a really good implementation with them, and we look forward to a long and strong relationship together. Um, I too would like to just give a quick background of Orion and uh, why we exist. We exist. We are a portfolio accounting technology by advisors for advisors, and our goal is to liberate you so that you can enjoy your business again through our technology. We have 1,300 plus advisors and institution uh, on, on our platform today, serving over $600 billion in assets under administration. Um, just over 2 million plus accounts, financial accounts, and we're growing at a pace where we're adding a new firm a day to our platform. Um, as of right now, we have 350 employee, employees um, in our service and, and support, and of those, 55 IT employees, whether that be development or techn technology support. Um, we have coverage 24-7 uh, across the U.S., and we have offices in Omaha, Nebraska as our home, and then also in New York and Seattle to serve our, our East and West Coast customers. So how does Orion do it? <clears throat> what, what we pride ourselves in is, is providing a customization or, or a model that fits your business. Um, in, in order to help you scale, that's where we offload that back office uh, support and aggregation of data onto the Orion platform so that you can scale. Um, integration, and, and in order for greater efficiency, which I'm going to talk about and show you some of the Salesforce integration we have done, and innovation that anticipates the needs. We like to innovate, come up with ideas um, that, that you think you may not need yet. Um, we are serving, these are the different kind of types of customers that we serve, uh, multi-custodial uh, fiduciary advisors, firms in transition, retail RAs, broker dealers, and TAMPs independent advisors as well as established firms. We, we have really four main or four to five main core competencies that, that we focus on, and that is account aggregation with, with data reconciliation where we're pulling data in from the various custodians and financial institutions on behalf of the firms that we contract with in order to bring that data into the Orion system. Um, that allows them to use our, other, use our other systems such as trading and rebalance, performance reporting, gain loss, value reporting, as well as a billing system, and integrations. Integrations is where a lot of the fun stuff happens in bringing some of those outside uh, vendors and, and partners that we have such as financial planning, CRMs, uh, risk analytics, and integrating with those platforms to kind of give you a best in breed, pick and choose which type of integrations you would like to use. On screen here is just a few other of, of some of the uh, offerings that we have. We have a mobile app branded to your firm. Um, we have a very open API that we allow our advisors, our, our more sophisticated advisors that have developers on staff that want to develop to our API. And we've had 
firms do things with our API that we hadn't thought of, such as creating new front ends, creating their own portals for their investors, as, as well as just taking the data and using it in third-party systems that they see fit. So why clients choose Orion is, is really because of our, our number one, our open integration uh, approach. We have a cloud-based system, 100% in the cloud, um, a customizable reporting suite where we include actual video too. We have firms that actually include video in the statements that they send out to their customers each quarter. Um, we have a client portal. The end investor can come in and see their aggregated experience of their financial accounts. Um, we have specialized support teams, uh, some of our, a little bit about our security and rebalance and business intelligence so you can get a, a high level look at your business when you're on the Orion platform. Which brings me right into the Salesforce integration. I want to get right into this to talk about the Salesforce platform as a whole. If you're not familiar with it, it it's a pretty robust platform. They have developed a, a, an app exchange experience, kind of like the smartphone. Uh, if you have a, a smartphone with the app stores, whether it be Android or Apple, they've created their own type of app store called the App Exchange to allow you to integrate with, with various uh, products that, that have developed um, um, an app to actually integrate with Salesforce, and we have done that. So you can find us on the Salesforce App Exchange. If you just Google that and search for Orion Connect, you'll see some information about our app and what it provides if you're a Orion customer. When we set out to build this integration with Salesforce, we knew we could really do whatever we want. They have a very open API experience that allows us as a technology firm to be able to come in and develop as much as we want to the Salesforce experience. We wanted to, to really create an experience that is one user interface. And it's hard enough, you got to learn a CRM, and if you are using Orion, you have to learn the Orion platform and that user experience. We really wanted to blend the two and create one experience. We firmly believe that the CRM is the main hub of any financial advisory firm. Everybody's going to have a CRM. And then you're going to have portfolio accounting as well. But all of your day-to-day -day activities and processes and workflows are always coming out of your CRM. And so we wanted to bring an overlay in that brings the Orion functionality and complements your CRM. And we do that by data syncing, uh, pushing over all the portfolios, the households, and financial accounts over into Salesforce. Uh, we have bi-directional syncing. There's, there's a certain amount of fields that are – uh, the same within Orion, whether they are and, and in within the CRM, such as name and address. We want you to be able to update the address in Salesforce, and we collect that change and update Orion, and vice versa, so that you're really making your change in one system. Contextual linking, we want to link. That What that means is really when you're on a record in Salesforce, you're looking at a household record. We gave contextual single, single sign-on linking to bounce over into the Orion system on contextually based on that record whether it be to run a report or to look at a dashboard or to get to the main Orion Connect system, all from the Salesforce user experience. And so I'd like to show you a little bit, of some screenshots of what that looks like. Starting with, with the, the household here, this is a look at Salesforce Financial Services Cloud and the Lightning experience. And what we sync is we, we sync over all the households. This is one household record and kind of showing you some of the data that we sync over, the, the demographic data for a household. And then what Orion does is calculate performance and values and gain loss for those portfolios that are within Orion, and we push that into Salesforce. Having that data into Salesforce, one kind of blends the two and links the two uh, data sets together, but it also provides you the ability to use Salesforce reports and dashboards that we're providing you this data. Since we're providing you performance, you could run cool reports or create dashboards ba based on your top performing clients or your top performing strategy, and whatnot. We also sync over all the financial accounts that are tied to the household. What this is showing you here is all the financial accounts related to the household. So you can see there's about five or six accounts here. We sync a lot of the same data, but at a financial account level. So we still sync over the individual financial account performance and values and gain loss and some other Orion fields, such as the model or fee schedule, whatever you're charging that customer, all that information is, is set up in Orion and pushes over to Salesforce. Holdings is another big part of it. So you can see what holdings the, the financial account has. We sync over the, the name of the holding, the, the market value, the class, the description, or the category of that, that holding, as well as market price the current number of shares, and that market value. So all the holdings at a glance are here within Salesforce. 
So that's, that's really the data sync. We kind of have a data sync we work. We're tying into Salesforce's API, and we're pushing that data every morning. So when we get that data from the custodians and the financial institutions, and we are uh, loading in that data into Orion, we're then reconciling and making sure that matches, and then we push that on over into Salesforce each morning. Then throughout the day, we're just looking for changes. So as you update an address in, in Salesforce, we're updating that in Orion. If you're updating a financial account uh, model or, or a fee schedule in Orion, we push that over every 10 minutes. We're constantly syncing data changes back and forth throughout the day. The second part of the integration is giving you the links, which I was talking about earlier, the Orion contextual links. We don't push over every field that we have or is tracked, that is tracked in a household or a financial account in Orion, but we give you look-throughs. So we give you a full, the Orion household editor, just like Salesforce has a household or, or an account editor, excuse me. Orion has its own household editor. We want to give you just a quick link to jump over. So if you want to look at household, uh, the, the full editor, if you want to run reports, Orion calculated performance reports or transactions, we don't sync financial activity. That's a ton of, a ton of data that we, if we were going to actually sync that. So we give you a look through back into Orion. That blue bar there allows you right on the household to just touch the household editor, and it pops open a new tab, and you'll see the household editor you're editing real time in Orion, and you're never really leaving Salesforce. Same with running reports or looking at assets directly in Orion or transactions. We also have a dashboard of 50-plus tiles. We call them tiles that you can bring on to screen, and they consist of other integrations that Orion has, such with financial planning or risk analytics systems, um, to name a couple of financial planning like Money Guy Pro or Riskalyze. We have tiles that will show you how that particular household's financial planning will do in with our power of the integration with Money Guy Pro, and you can show that tile here right through Salesforce. It's right on the page layout. So here's just a quick look of once we touch the household editor, this is what it looks like in Orion. You're still within Salesforce, but you're actually within Orion real time. You make your changes and hit save, and that data syncs over into the Salesforce record. I talked a little bit about all of our other core uh, systems, such as trading and rebalance. We have a full suite of functionality being a portfolio accounting system that we tie into what we call as our main system of Orion Connect, and we kind of have an app layout and we have, this is all the rest of our functionality framed within Salesforce, whether it be the new account center or our trade order management or performance analytics, per, uh, being able to view report batches or run reports in mass. These are all the rest of our tools that we have framed in. So we really see integration as, as being a, a, a how can we make your life easier, and we feel like we've accomplished that with the feedback from our firms that we service that use this integration, Buckingham, as well has provided feedback is how can we make the experience as seamless as possible, even though you're using two systems. And we feel like we've accomplished that a lot, and we're always continuing to, to improve this integration and provide more, more and more flexibility as far as what we sync over to Salesforce versus what contextual linking we provide and laying you on to different spots in Orion based on the record you are on within Salesforce. So that's just a quick overview of the Orion integration and all hand it over to David. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. When we think about um, any implementation, and John touched on it um, significantly in his early comments, uh, adoption and, and user engagement is, is critical, right? We know, having done this for a long time, that any project success is ultimately going to be dependent on two things. One, getting the technology right. Um, and, and the the, the honest truth is we usually do that, right? The technology is usually not where we fall down. Where we fall down on our projects, not, I'm not speaking this project specifically, but nationally across you know, the United States, is we, we mess up on the user engagement and adoption, right? We know that we've got to drive that from the beginning uh, of any engagement. And so when we talk about change management, we're talking about getting users ready, willing, and able for new ways of working. Right? We're changing what they've done in some cases for an awful long time. And uh, we need them ready to go when we start. The, the other piece of this is really important is that this is what drives our ROI. There's always value in having a new system in place. But the real value and where you really get the return from your money uh, or your investment you're making 
is on users using the system the way you designed it to happen. Um, and, and so that's um, that's where we focused on this project. John rightfully and, and Buckingham at the outset said we've got to get this part right. So let's talk about it. Uh, why change management other than, yeah, we want to drive our ROI, but how does it do it? Um, there's a ton of data out there that will, will share, that will show you that projects are six times more likely to be successful with change management than those that don't in terms of meeting your goals and objectives. Um, it's, it's active engagement. It's, it's talking to the stakeholders at the right time. It's making sure the communications are laid out uh, and training happens. doesn't mean you can't be successful without change management, uh, but certainly your odds are, are much, much lower. The bottom left graph helps draw the picture or paint the picture to say we know there's going to be disruption when we go live. In fact, disruption is actually good, right? Disruption leads us to progress. But what we don't want to do is be in a disruptive state that actually costs us operational efficiency, right? If, if, if Buckingham's advisors were using the new financial cloud tool and couldn't figure out how to service their clients or begin making mistakes, we would have a significant issue, right? Um, and, and this all of a sudden our ROI would not only would that be positive, it would it'd be, it'd be negative, right? So, so we've got to fix that problem. We've got to minimize that disruption, and that's where the change piece comes in because we want to get, again, users ready, willing, and able to work in new ways um, and using new processes and using, using new tools. And oh, by the way, that's on day one, not on day 10. So how do we do that? Um, Proficient brings this methodology to bear, and I've got a picture of it here, just some fine print. Don't worry about that. But what I want to tell you, whether you use our methodology or whether you use ProSci or Cotter or Lamarche, there's a bunch of them out there, most of them are pretty similar, is, is have a plan. You know, if we do change well and in the engagement, it's not a fly by the seat of your pants type approach. It's not, oh, send a, an email on Monday, train on Tuesday, and go live on Wednesday, right? It, it, we've got to do it early, and I'll talk about what that looked like on this, on this project here in a minute. Our methodology has four phases, and we're going to bring the right pieces to bear at any time, but it's very iterative, right? And, and we, we, our, our users, our stakeholders, people are dynamic. They change over the course of the project. The project conditions, scope, timeline, you name it, the project team members themselves may be changing. We have to be able to react to that, which is why we have an iterative methodology. At the same time, what I do want to tell you is we always start with the why. Why are we doing this engagement? What's the case for change? Mission and vision is all great, but what does it really mean for the users? And if I'm a, if a specific user, what does it mean to me? John touched on those back on slide 10 when he talked about why Buckingham made the decision to move to the Salesforce Financial Cloud. That was critical for us to get out there early to the key stakeholders and to the key end users because what that does is that drives buy-in. And when I've got someone who's bought into why we're doing this and thinks it's a good idea and they see the benefit to themselves, then they're more likely to read my communications. They're going to go to training. They're actually going to pay attention when they get there. And all that's going to lead to a workforce that, again, is ready, willing, and able to work when we go live. So what did we do here on this engagement with that background? John talked about some of the challenges that we were facing at the beginning, right? And, and Joe touched on some of those too here a few minutes ago. What did we know coming in? We knew that buy-in and adoption was going to be a challenge because there was already a lot of stuff going on. In fact, they were wrapping up a major technology implementation as we started the engagement, even with the delay that John talked about. That change saturation, change fatigue that he mentioned is real. Uh, if you've been around projects long enough, which I suspect most of the people on this call have, you know what that means when you run into that with your, um, uh, with, with your users, right? People can only absorb so much at one time, and when you hit the limit, it's like a cup full of water. It just keeps you, know, you keep in water, and it keeps falling out. We've got to be. We had to be very wary of that. We also knew one of the challenges around this implementation was going to be uh, that we, we were going to have new processes, but some were going to be automated, and others were going to have to be manual. And we would we would need to communicate that to folks so they knew what to do, which ones were going to work in which ways. Uh, and what it meant to them. We wanted to leverage modern and various communication vehicles. 
um, and not just rely on email. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, and then training, one of the things that John and, and Liz and the team made very clear at the outset was training had to be relevant. We had to be able to work across a pretty dispersed audience, some in the office, many out uh, in the field. And it had to be methodical and well thought out. We were also challenged without a, a, an LMS system, a learning management system in place. That's their, uh, they, Buckingham, are working on putting that in place now. But the point is, we could be successful without that too. It's just something we're going to work through. So we had a lot, a lot of things to work with. And oh, by the way, a pretty quick timeline too. Um, but that, that was something we overcame as well. So we applied the science of our methodology. And I showed the methodology up there. And I call that the science, right? Because that's what we're going to do. It's the roadmap. Um, but the other part of change management is the art. How do you take that methodology and apply the right aspects to what we do to an audience that's changing every day, right? That's dynamic. First thing we did was we committed to clear, transparent, and timely communications. We had to earn the trust of our stakeholders and of our end users at the outset. Back to that whole buy-in thing, if we didn't do that quickly, we were going to lose them, and it's hard to make a sec you, know, you don't get too many opportunities to make a, you know, a second chance at a first impression, right? So we needed to get that right at the outset, especially with the short timeline. We wanted to establish two-way communication channels, right? Where project teams fail a lot that I see is we send emails out to our constituents. We do other things, but it's all one-way pushes to our audiences. It's important for us as change management folks to understand are our messages landing? What concerns do our stakeholders have? What questions do they have that we can answer to alleviate the stress? So we were involved extremely early in the design process, right? Just by being in the room when those design sessions happened, again, change management was involved early. We were able to understand where the concerns were. We learned a lot about those processes I talked about, and we were able to follow up and build relationships. So we did build that two-way communication channel. To point three, we maintained close ties with the technical team from there throughout the project, right? And that became critically important as the processes evolved. And as I mentioned, some of them were manual, some of them were automated, uh, and that was by, by, by constraints that we had that were given to us uh, for compliance reasons, for other, other reasons. So we couldn't change them all, but we needed to understand what they were. We needed to understand, help our constituents, our target users understand the why even behind that. We built role-based training that would allow, um, oh, I skipped point four, excuse me. Um, we did leverage multiple communication channels. One of the things in change management is um, if you want anything to land, you have to say it um, at least seven different times over three different channels. And, and I personally think that's a dated statistic, um, that with the introduction of the millennial generation, we have to say things four, uh, seven, eight, nine times over four or five different channels, and one of them ought to be social media or um, something with 140 characters or less. So we've got to get creative in how we communicate. Uh, it can't just all be emails. We use posters. We use signage uh, in this case. We, we engage the, uh, the advisory team directors and leaders. We use team meetings. We use a lot of things to help reinforce the messages and get them out there. Now to the training part. I was so excited about that. Um, we did build role-based training that could be repurposed. We, um, we did it using different modes. In the office, we did in-person training, but we knew that a lot of our advisors are out in the field, so we built something that would work remotely. Um, and then everything we did, we wanted to make sure it could be leveraged in the future, uh, whether via recording or for hot topic sessions that, that Buckingham does on occasion as well. Uh, we tried to customize it and make it as pertinent uh, as we could to these users, right? If it's too generic, then all the things in, that, that the technical team does over the course of the project to perfect the, the technology for the audience, we miss in our training, right? That doesn't do us a lot of good, so we've got to customize it. But we did leverage the FSC libraries for quick access and, and standardized training to help augment that, to, to make it uh, – both to make it real, but also to allow our users to take their learning and their knowledge to the next level. Remember, we can get them so far at the beginning, but over time, they're going to learn and absorb more. So we, with the access to these repositories, we're able to continue the learning even now. So with that, let me turn it back to John uh, to talk about where we are today 
compared to where we as a as a firm are uh, where we started the project. Great. Thanks, David. And, and thanks, Joe, as well for, for detailing out some of those Orion pieces. So as you can see from what Joe walked through with that integration with Orion, we took a huge step forward in our platform for, for our advisors and our client service teams. You know, we put in two brand new systems. Um, we integrated those together. We gave them, you know, as I kind of mentioned, almost that one single pane of glass to be able to work in, uh, being able to use Salesforce and the power of the CRM to quickly, without switching applications, move into Orion, uh, begin to do their work over there that they needed, while also you know, pulling that relevant data back into Salesforce uh, as necessary to keep things in sync. And so you know, as you look at it and some of the struggles that we had before um, we went live with you know, antiquated technologies, a poor user experience, lack of integration, those kind of things, you know, that move to Salesforce, that integration with Orion checked a lot of those boxes for us and, and really began to move us forward. But then if you go beyond some of that as well, it's important to look at you know, how it changed our team dynamic, how it changed some of the work here within our organization. Before we had um, Salesforce in, in the integration with Orion, if I was going to a meeting with individuals, our advisory team leaders were going to meetings with their advisory teams, there was an effort up leading up to that meeting in order to begin pulling data out of various systems and trying to get it assembled in reports that could be used. And frequently, you would walk into a meeting and you could have an advisor who had one set of data and, and their leader who had another set of data. And so then it became questions and dialogue around where did your data come from? How did you get this data? And why is it, when was this one updated versus what I have? When was it updated? Our meetings were focused more around understanding where data came from and what it was really saying than on the conversations to help move our business forward and what we could do. Um, we weren't able to coach as much. We weren't able to be proactive and kind of look at trends and, and past data and make adjustments as we went forward. And, and so that, those conversations were also siloed uh, between who had access to what information, whether it was across teams or even looking at the whole organization. So with the, with the move to, to Salesforce, it, it began to open a lot of doors for us. We got transparency into data. You know, no longer was it, hey, I put data into the system, but I struggle getting it out. You know, I put data in, and all of our advisory teams and our leadership have dashboards and reports that are built out for them so they can quickly go in and see real time where they're at now, what trends look like coming up, see future forecasts and projections for them, um, which obviously then helps us lead to more collaborative meetings as we go. You know, we can now begin to talk about the details, talk about what we're seeing in the data and, and within our, our business operations, rather than just spend time talking about fundamentally how did we assemble a report or how did we get to that data. And then as I mentioned, you know, those reporting and those, and those metrics that are, are there for us, these are a big piece to what's helping us be able to drive adoption of Salesforce as well. Now that we're able to build dashboards and view and track and see where people are at, it becomes more of a need and more natural for advisors to actually utilize the system. They know that you know, people can run a report or view a dashboard at any point in time right now to, to kind of see how their office is doing, how their teams are doing, which then incents them more to begin using the platform itself um, and provide us more feedback or find ways that we can make it more useful for them. And so those are just some of those changes that we saw even early on. You know, we've been live at this point for, for just over six months now um, and seeing a lot of evolution in adoption and use of a CRM platform, reporting capabilities, metrics capabilities, those kind of things as we go. So finally, as we kind of begin to wrap things up, um, thought it would be great to look at, you know, what are some of those important things to know and keep in mind that we realized, you know, our lessons learned, if you will, as we went through an implementation like this. Um, setting expectations is critically important. Um, same with any project that's going on out there, but especially as you're moving to, you know, a core new platform like a CRM, 
you know, making sure your end users know what your ultimate goal is, know what you're planning to deliver to them on a go live date. We, we did a, a good job of this, but we still have users who you know, questioned, I thought we were going to get all of this automation that came out, or I thought you know, this would be so much different. Um, there's no silver bullet as we go through this process. And so making sure you continue to kind of set that expectation and level set you know, with users and also your leadership as well of, of what's coming with this. Um, communication and education are key. So David talked a lot about this. Just continually reinforcing with everyone why the change is coming, what's going to be part of that change, how it impacts them. You know, you, you can't do um, too much of that. Same way with training. You know, we did numerous on-site tra on trainings with our offices. Um, many lunch and learns here with our local teams. Team training specifically could always go back and do more and more of that as, as you go along. So I, I'd encourage you all if you're looking to move to, to Salesforce or, or anything that you continue to look for ways to just layer that in throughout your project. I, I touched on it a little bit before with the expectations piece, but users are always going to want more. You know, they're going to get in and they're going to see something they thought would be different or something they thought would be better uh, with the new application. They'd also look at it and say, hey, I see improvements that could be here. Can we do these enhancements? Um, so you have to be ready for that as well. You know, it's not a, a, a one and done type of thing. Um, you've got to be ready. You're going to have issues. Uh, this was something that we continue to kind of inform both, again, our users and leadership about. No project is ever perfect as it goes out there. There's always going to be something that got missed or something that could have been done a little bit better. And so making sure that they understand that you know, if, they, if those are identified by them or if your, your core support team identifies those, that those will get resolved. Um, but being able to kind of work through those things as you go. Users and team members need to think bigger than themselves. It's easy to get a new application and, and start to look at it and say, I need this to work this way for me. Um, or you know, my team could actually use it to do this. But you know, in an organization like ours where we're 23 offices, 300 associates, people using the system in different ways, there's always ripple effects as well. So you have to be able to have those conversations with users. You have to set that um, kind of guiding principle, if you will, that you may see something that would benefit you if a process has changed or, or something is, is adjusted. But how is that going to ripple effect into everyone else? And I alluded to it a while ago, but it's never done. Um, you know, our, our product owner is, is key for us. We, have, we now have an ongoing Salesforce steering committee that meets and talks about any issues that they've seen, any things that they've now identified that could be future enhancements or those kind of things. You've got to have that kind of planned out for how you're going to own this and evolve it going forward. Because that evolution is what keeps people coming back. It keeps them kind of looking for more, and it, it keeps them willing to use the system because they know it's not, hey, it was put in, and so we're just going to stay with this for you know, the next three to five years. There's never going to be any change. Um, you've got to give them kind of that continuous look at how it's evolving, how you're developing to meet their needs. And with that, um, wraps up the, the conversation from our side today on you know, some of the keys of Salesforce, the integrations that we have available with Orion, and, and that, that importance of change management of going through a project like this.
Yeah, looks like they did such a good job that nobody has any questions. Um, if anybody does, feel free to follow up with us and we can make sure to put you in contact with any of the speakers that you might need to speak with. Uh, to wrap things up here, I would encourage you to follow us online. Uh, we have a ton of great content on integration, uh, organizational change management, Salesforce, uh, what's happening in the financial industry, and so much more on our website. You can visit Proficient.com and click on the Insights tab for all of those things I just mentioned. And that wraps it up. Thank you so much everybody. Have a great day.